Uh, I'm Chris Hart from the, the Chief Research Officer at Lux Research uh, and with me today I have uh, Rob uh, Von Lang, uh, the Chief Innovation Officer uh, for DSM. Now Rob, you've uh, you got a, a fascinating role and then there was, there was a journey you took yep. uh, to get to the, uh, the Chief Innovation Officer position. Tell us a little bit about that journey. How, how did you end up there? What was your motivation? And, and what was the background that made you the person for the job? I think the background for the company was that we wanted to move from internally looking to externally looking and, and uh, use innovation more as a driver for the business growth. So before that, uh, that was in 2006, uh, DSM was more an operational excellence focused company and we wanted to have more market driven innovation and, and growth. I was running at that point in time uh, our food business and I had been experimenting with an, uh, what, you could, what we now call an innovation center for DSM, a small innovation center in that food business. Mm. And that was fairly successful. So I was asked to do the same thing for the whole company and, and use the same uh, uh, setup with a, a, a new business development center outside the scope of the running business, but not completely in isolation. <clears throat> And um, yeah, that's what I've been trying to do since 2006. Right. Now, there's uh, the, even the, the internal relationship of your role, uh, the, the relationship between the, the chief innovation officer and the, and the chief technology officer is always, uh, uh, sometimes it's, it can be contentious in some companies, it can be confusing in some companies. How, how do you manage that relationship in DSM? What is the, what is the, the, the synergy that you try and find in, in the two roles? Yeah. Yeah, I always say we are two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. uh, because we need our technology uh, to get to new know-how, insights, what have you. So we use money to convert it into know-how and then that know-how we try to uh, bring into products that are profitable in the market to, to get to new money. Mm -hmm. So that is a cycle that both of us manage. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way it's set up is in, in DSM that the CTO reports to the, the chief innovation officer. Um, yeah, that is a practical way of doing things. Uh, I report to the CEO, but we both are in the top leadership team of the company. Right. So uh, I think that it's clearly not contentious at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think it works very well to, uh, together. And um, I think the, the main idea of setting it up like this was in 2006, when we were very internally focused and, and our R&D was still more an internal university than anything else. And we got the blame that we spent a lot of money, but not a lot of came out of it. I think that by now is more or less gone, that notion. We have indeed changed a lot. We have increased our uh, speed of innovation uh, more than double in the meantime. And um, there is never, well, never is maybe a big word, but th there is no longer this idea that uh, R&D is just spending money because they like it or something. No, it's right. all very much aimed to the business goals and the business drivers that we have. And also all the business groups no longer question that at all. Right. Okay. Now, how do you, the interesting part of that is, um, and, and in that relationship is the overall portfolio management of the, and presumably you work on Horizons, so companies have Horizon 1, 2, and 3, mm -hmm. and I know you have eBuzz that, that you work on, which is very much Horizon 3 for yes, the most part. Yes, who, who has control or what, how does that portfolio, the overall portfolio get managed to make sure that all Horizons are addressed and business unit needs are addressed? What's the, what's yeah. the dynamic there? Well, in, in the end, of course, that is the, the, the managing board of DSM that more or less decides it. Mm -hmm. But we have uh, uh, agreed on a couple of principles. And one of them is that we more or less uh, invest about 25% of all we do in what we call red box. So those are business fields that are not addressed by the current business groups of DSM. Yeah. That is all put in the innovation center to give it uh, air cover, as we say. So uh, time to, to grow without the daily pressure. The other part is managed by the business groups. So that's 75% of what we do. Mm. But we have an innovation council where all the innovation directors of all the business groups sit, including myself, I chair that council. And together we oversee uh, the whole innovation in the company. We have the joint programs for acceleration. Uh, we together manage the red box composition. Got it. So, and, and then we give advice to the managing board how to deal with those things. Right, got it. And this, this idea of the 25% uh, and the, you know, in these very emerging fields, very, very new to DSM, that's, uh, how long, are you there yet? Are you at 25% yeah. now? Or, and how yeah, long have you been there? Has it... Well, we have 
grown that since 2006. I think we reached about 30% at a certain point in really? time. Um, and then we thought, okay, now this is sort of getting out of hand because all of these things grow and grow and grow. Yeah. So that's when we started to focus a little bit. Okay. Uh, and now we're uh, this year, I think we're at 24. Got it. So, so you'll bounce it around 25. Yeah. Like so and then, then we said, no, more or less, this is what we can afford. This is more or less what we should do and keep it, it more or less in this ballpark. Got it. How did that 30 to 25% sort of downshift occur? Was that uh, just looking at programs that maybe didn't fit or was it right sizing the programs that you had? What was the, was it a mix? It's just focus. So okay. we, we took out uh, projects that we felt in the, the whole scale were maybe uh, at position five, six, seven, hmm. and, and we said, let's first do the first four. Yeah. Uh, and and, and we, uh, we've done that throughout the, those EBAs. Yeah, got it. So only focus on those things that you feel are the most um, um, prominent and, and, and probably have the best chance of succeeding. Yeah, got it. Okay. And you mentioned in 2006 that the, uh, the R&D group uh, it felt like a, a university and everyone wondered when results would come out. It's you know, a little bit inconsistent or maybe not. Uh, uh, delivering what was hoped for the for the investment, yeah, um, and obviously that's changed now, and that was part of the the responsibility and the and the mission that you had. So, so what is the distribution now between what happens internally and the how you look at R and D spend or innovation spend that c occurs externally? Do you, yeah, do you track that? At yeah, all? sure. It varies very much per business. Okay. Um, so there are businesses that are above ten percent. Hmm. Um, and on top of that, of course, you also need to take into account that we have now more than in the past um, also technology that we source externally, like licensing in uh, or M&A of small startups. We do the corporate venturing that we do. Yeah. So and that has grown, actually. And the internal R&D hasn't grown that much. Um, so I would say most of the growth has come from the external element, which is also easier to do, of course, because if you say, whatever, let's do 10, 15% externally, and you first need to cut yeah. uh, a few hundred R&D people to make that possible, that is, of course, a more difficult journey than right. that you say, we grow into external. The bigger bigger pie means uh, one, if one, one yeah. slice can stay the same. More and that has that. worked quite well for a couple of years. Now we are more or less stable at the same level. Uh, okay. Uh, so you think that's optimized? So that 10 to 15 percent, does that feel feel about right? Well, 15 would be great. Okay. Uh, but I think there are still businesses where we, we are nowhere near that. And there are businesses okay. that are clearly there. So that it has also a little bit to do sometimes with the composition of the business, but also still sometimes with the traditional mindset of the not invented here syndrome. Okay. So you still even with the success and, and, and DSM has looked at as being very successful from an innovation perspective yeah even with that success there are still pockets where there are still is, ongoing yeah, yeah. ongoing challenges yeah. and, and there's, there's still work to do yeah and of course uh, also when we acquire businesses um, that have not gone through this journey mm. um, they basically need to catch up so and, and then because a big part of the company is already in this mindset, we assume that the others will catch on immediately, but that's actually not the case. So you basically also there have to go through the journey uh, right. for several years before they are at the same uh, level of comfort with them. Got it. What's the biggest thing you've learned of this, this journey you've been on to, to date? What's, what's, what's the biggest learning that you would, you would tell people right now? I think um, well, so many things, but yeah. the most important is that most of our failures have come from not checking early enough and thoroughly enough whether somebody was actually waiting for those wonderful inventions and mm. for those solutions that we thought we had for the world. Yeah. And uh, so many examples of that, that. If you look at our graveyard, I think that that is where m most of it can be learned. Yeah. And um, I always say some of our internal experts in the, those new business fields are just a few weeks ahead of us when we do the um, right. the, 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 the project reviews. And right. I think what you should introduce is people that are a couple of years ahead of you externally right. that really know what they are talking about. And they will challenge your plans and say, really? Right. Uh, nobody's waiting for this. And, and that is what you need to bring in. And that's for some people, I would say, uh, uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's probably the best thing you can do. Yeah. So how much of, uh, so that's that's hiring in capability. Um, yeah. How much of it is also solved by uh, more rapid evaluation and, and uh, I guess access to the outside world 
So having more conversations across a value chain, looking at different angles, different capabilities. Yeah. Is that, oh, that there's is a balance course, in yeah, there as yeah. well, right? that, So that is, of course, happening far more than in the past. Right. And the way we look also at the setting up of ventures versus doing project management. So in the past, we were doing really project management, uh, stage gating and so on, on the project level. Mm -hmm. Now we say we want to create a venture. A venture is probably made up of several projects, but also things we bring in from the outside. So we look at the whole thing and we look at the maturity of a venture with the method uh, that we have adopted from uh, the Bell Mason Group. And that says something a little bit like a stage gate, but then for the maturity of a venture, Got around tw 12 different elements yeah. that will tell you how far you are along in setting up a new business. Right, got it. And that's, that's interesting you mentioned venturing. Um, the, the venturing um, arm of the, of, of the business, that clearly falls under the, the, the CIO's yes, yes. Um, purview. Yeah. Um, what is the, what's the value that the venturing group brings to you that, that other functions or, you know, what, what, do you look, what do you look to them, for them to do that maybe you can't get anywhere else? What's, what's the one thing they do for you? Uh, the, it's, it's an important element in uh, in the scouting that we do. Mm -hmm. We look at about 500 companies per year, yeah. and and especially in the fields where we want to innovate and where we want to uh, move into. So what it does is that it gives us uh, through those companies an insight in how that is developing. Since we only invest in about one percent of the companies we look at, it predominantly tells us what not to do right. Um, right. and it gives us clues where things are moving and there's hardly any other tool uh, that you can use to to do that so efficiently and so effectively. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so I guess, you know, one last question to, to finish off. What, is, uh, what does success look like for you, the way you view the, the CIO role, the way, even the way you view its impact on DSM? What does that look like for you five years from now, ten years from now? What's, what's your vision? Okay. Um, well, what I would be um, very proud of, uh, and, and I think we can reach that in 10 years from now, is that our total portfolio is really aimed at uh, the sustainability goals that we strive for. Okay. So like we call it people plus or, or eco plus, we are very much um, progressing on that. And then that there are a couple of very tangible businesses by that time. I, For instance, I really hope that the biofuels business, the second generation biofuels business that, that is using uh, waste, biomass, corn stover, cane trash, uh, wood, whatever. Mm. Um, so that we really go to the circular economy, that we really stop uh, polluting the planet and, and increasing the temperature, because I, I really think the world is on, a, hmm. on the wrong track. Yeah. And um, we have the capabilities of, uh, of solving at least part of those problems. And I would be very proud of having a couple of those yeah. solutions put in place for the world. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's fascinating. I, I could a I ask that same question of, of many executives and many will talk about financial outcomes. They'll talk about growth of the business. They'll talk in very, in very concrete terms. But your response was very mission driven. It was, it was yeah. more passion driven. It is. Um, but by the way, I'm, I'm also convinced that that will uh, come along with good business. <laughs> sure. No, absolutely. I mean, and we, I think everyone's always said that the You've always said the chance of success goes up if, the, if there's passion behind the mission of that success. Yeah. So no, that's uh, fascinating. Um, again, Rob, thanks for your time. DSM is, is looked at uh, around the world as being one of the leaders in the kind of innovation best practices. So I really appreciate the time and, and the insights. Well, you're welcome.